Herbert James Elliot, Hustling Herb is the toast of Dublin, of Edinburgh, of London, of Perth. All over the world, everyone is talking about the most remarkable athlete from a remarkably athletic nation. And this is the now famous race that made the young Australian the greatest miler the world has ever seen. His fellow countryman, little Albert Thomas, sets the pace. And what a fast one it is to pull Elliot along. For a world record mile cannot be done by just one man. Three men are involved here, the three leaders, Albert Thomas, Merv Lincoln, Herb Elliot. Three Australians out to tear up the record books. Coming up to the last lap and Albert Thomas, the pace setter, has dropped back. His job's done. Now Elliot is on his own in the lead, his superb running style pounding out the yards. He's almost sprinting the whole of the last lap, running so fast that no one has a chance to keep up with him. Even the cameraman finds it difficult. But this is the moment that makes Elliot wonder run possible. The moment he knows that he can still go on faster yet. Even the loyal Dublin fans give all their cheers, not to their own man, Ron Delaney, but to this amazing young hustler from Australia. How does he do it? Elliot attributes it all to his fitness. And as you watch him finish the Miracle Mile to end all Miracle Miles, marvel at the wonderfully calm way he takes this, his greatest race. It's the eighth time Elliot's run a four-minute mile, but this time it's well below four minutes. Three minutes, 54.5. It sounds incredible, and it becomes even more so when you hear Herb Elliot talk about it with Max Robertson. Well, Herb, you look pretty fresh at the end of that mile, that famous mile of yours. Did you feel fairly fresh? Well, you generally feel finishing the same each time that you do run. You <coughs> expend the maximum effort, as I always try to do when I'm running, but some nights you just seem to run faster than others, so I felt the same, perhaps a little bit more exhilarated after the run than I normally do feel. Do you think you could have gone faster if really pressed? That's a very hard question to answer. You perhaps could go faster, but uh, then if somebody pressed you, you might just drop dead on the spot. You're never quite sure what's going to happen. Now, some while ago, I seem to remember you said that you thought 3.55 was pretty well the ultimate for the moment, and you've beaten that. You've got a good memory. <laughs> That's the trouble with uh, stating times, especially as, as your aim or as an ultimate or anything like that. It's, um, it limits you in a way, and also people hold it against you <laughs> when you go better than it. But uh, I find that it's better not to limit yourself to any sort of time at all. If I make my ambition, say, 3.55, I just said I thought that would be the best time that somebody could do. It wasn't my ambition. My ambition is to do my best. If I limited myself to 3.55, I'm sure that once I'd run 3.54, I'd think, right over here, pack up, that's it. You've done your best. But I still feel that the time can be improved on. You do? Oh, yes. Mm. What do you think is, is going to be somewhere near the ultimate, where man cannot go faster? Oh, here we go again. <laughs> um, well, it's very hard to say. I mean, 15 years ago, they were saying that the ultimate was a uh, four-minute mile. Well, even that that was impossible uh, from medical sources and also from athletic sources, that was considered to be the, the fastest that human being could run. Well, it's been broken many, many times now. And uh, I don't know just how far the human body can go. We seem to be improving all the time. There must be a stopping point somewhere, but I'm not just quite sure where it'll be. My own feeling is that we've had so many fast and new records since the war because of the colossal improvement in technique, but then that must have come almost to an end, surely? Yes, well, um, I don't know whether you'd say that there's been an improvement in technique in the distance running at all. Uh, I know, well, personally, myself and from the group of athletes that we train with, we don't worry about uh, technique in any way at all. Uh, the thing that we get is fitness, and I think that's where the improvement in distance r running has been. Uh, the realisation that the only way to get success is hard work and very hard work and a lot of sacrifices to be made. Although we do feel, of course, when you achieve something that it's well worth it. Running over sand dunes is the way to get fitness, you reckon? Mm, it's a very hard way to get it, too. <laughs> How long a day do you run over sand dunes? Well, at that time of the year, uh, when I'm running over sand dunes, I generally run two hours or so a day. But at the moment, I call it the, uh, the easy period. You don't do that much at all. Because you're running such a lot? That's right, yeah. What do you think about when you're running, when you're doing a record-breaking mile? Well, um, I think it was Emerson said that uh, you can't mix the, the physical and the mental. He found that um, he couldn't think clearly if he did much physical exercise. Well, you find it works the other way too, that while you're doing hard physical exercise, the mental is almost non-existent. And so that after a race, I often wonder myself what I thought of during the race. It's, you, I, I run in, I think it's almost entirely by instinct. 
the physical takes over and the, there's none of the mental left at all. I suppose you do think about a few things, but they're so very, very vague that after the race you've got no thought at all of what you did think of during the race. Your mind is almost like an amoeba. Amoe 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 that's <laughs> right. You don't hear the crowd. You very rarely hear the time that is called out while you're running around the laps. Uh, it's just almost non-existent at all. Do you really believe, Herb, that in the top flight of athletics, your class, there are any true amateurs left? Well, yes, I, I must say that there are all true amateurs, otherwise, <laughs> otherwise that, uh, I can't say anything else but that we are all true amateurs. You can't say it. But for instance, you've been uh, away from Australia now for quite a time, haven't you? That's long? right, yeah. Is that all on expenses? Yes, we uh, get our expenses paid by the... Uh, while I was in America, it was paid by the Athletic Union of America and uh, we were allowed $15 a day expenses, which we just managed to live on, and that's all. It's all right when you live in a country. I mean, you know where you can get a cheap meal and you can uh, get a bed and breakfast that's quite reasonable. But once you don't know a country, you find that uh, it's costing you quite a lot more money than you're allowed in your expenses. But anyway, we managed to get through on $15 a day. And since I joined up with the team, uh, we've been looked after. All our expenses have been paid. But henceforth, <coughs> I'm paying my own expenses. And that's why I'm not very interested in running on the continent. Uh, I just want to sort of have a look around, tour around and do it as I like and as I feel. You're never tempted to cross the borderline and if someone offers you very decent expenses to come and run, take them? That's another question I'm afraid I can't answer. You've got me back against the wall there. You've heard a lot of criticism recently of our uh, middle distance runners. What do you think of them? What well, I'll say this. Uh, I think that the uh, English sports riders are probably the most vicious in the world. Uh, that's funny that they sort of get them in a class, but that's just the way it is. Um, so that as soon as somebody starts to fall, well, they'll kick him down and then tread on him, uh, which is the case of Ibbotson and Piri. It's unfair, but then again, it's just the, the way that the press is run here. What about coaching in this country? Well, um, from what I've seen and from what I've heard from other countries, I do believe that, uh, contrary to what my manager, Mr. Bill Young, said, that England has the... Um, the best coaching system in the world. Uh, I think that's generally recognised throughout the world. It is by the athletes anyway, if it's not by others. Do you think the coaches have enough voice in the team selection? Well, I think it's very, very hard to allow team selection to coaches because naturally, as we all are, we're generally prejudiced to what we want ourselves, even if we try not to be. Uh, I've got no doubt in saying that Perth, the place that I come from, is the nicest town in the world. Well. <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to admit that I'm biased, you see, but if, if they did have coaches on the selection committee, I'm sure that there'd be a lot of wrangles on uh, just the goods and bad points of an athlete. Uh, generally, uh, looking at it on paper, it should be fairly simple. You pick out who's done the best times, and uh, there's your team. So why do you need the coaches? You need a good tactician too, don't you? Yeah, I guess so. Mm. Finally, what is it you think that's made you such a great runner? How long have you been running? I've been running seriously for about... Uh, I started after the Olympic Games in 1956. Um, I don't really know. I, I, I'd be thankful for the fact that I'm endowed with a great deal of natural ability. Uh, and I've worked hard. I'm grateful for the fact that I've been endowed with perseverance to work hard. See, most of it is passed on to you. I'm not responsible for much of it. I guess I owe most of it to my parents and my ancestors before me. I've been given the ability to develop my ability, and I've been given the ability anyway, <laughs> so uh, that's just something that I've developed, that's all, I was given it in the first place. And you want to go on developing it to the very full? Oh yes, I, I won't be happy until I do uh, my best, what, what I feel is my ultimate. I don't know what that is at all. Well, whatever it is, I think it's going to be great. Thank you very much, Herb. Thank you, Tom.